Actually, this is, um, so I think this is a nice, enjoyable uh, contrast, the back and forth between the theory theorists and the experimentalists. Um, I want to talk about looking for the, um, the everyone's favorite type of dark matter that Lawrence uh, no longer believes is what we're going to, or maybe never believes, uh, is, is what we're going <laughs> to. Is what we're going to find. Well, the, the the thing I wanted to say is that um, uh, from an experimental perspective, uh, the story I'm about to tell is compelling enough that a large number of people have spent, well, in my case anyway, almost my entire career uh, looking for this stuff. And so I want to back up a little bit and sort of give um, uh, my naive view of why it's compelling. In fact, back way up to uh, to, to gravity. So uh, here's uh, here's. Um, Where's the uh, laser top? There we go. Um, Newton actually, when he first talked about gravity and orbits, he sort of had this idea that if you throw a ball, uh, it goes a distance. If you throw it harder, it goes further. Uh, but gravity is trying to bend it. Um, and so the balance between it wanting to go straight, so-called centrifugal force, if you will, and gravity results in a point where you throw it just hard enough and you get an orbit. And that orbit is a balance between gravity and the tendency of the uh, of, the, of the, the rock to go straight. And if we come to the, um, the solar system, his prediction, uh, which is that the velocity of something is falling off if you get further away from the sun, and there are the planets, um, and then the measurement matches uh, uh, theory, uh, just Newtonian gravity, just beautifully. And in fact, uh, in some sense, if you measure this curve, uh, when you measure this curve, you've weighed the sun, because the sun is providing the force that's uh, holding all the planets together. And one of the main points here I want to make is that Newton was right um, that gravity has now been tested to sub from sub-millimeter scales to the size of the solar system billions of miles. That's a vast um, spatial range for which one simple theory uh, works beautifully. So then the thing is, why don't we go to the next scale up? And that's a galaxy, 100 billion stars, looks like a whirlpool, it's rotating. Everything is orbiting around its own sort of mutual gravity. Um, and does, the, uh, does, does, does gravity work there? Well, we think probably gravity works, but something certainly doesn't. This is a, this is a, this is a galaxy. This is, it's rotating. And here's, just like in my last graph, here's the velocity, sorry, the distance out from the center. And here's the velocity of things. And you predict something like this curve here if these ob objects on the periphery are behaving just like the solar system. The mass of the stars that are present is, what is, uh, is, what, is what's driving the rotation. And in fact, the data famously doesn't agree. This, is a, um, this has been measured now for some huge number of galaxies. And so there's some other form of matter, we think. I guess in principle, it could be that gravity is wrong, but there's lots of reasons we don't think that's the case. Uh, my laser is fully run out. Oh, there it is. Um, and so galaxies are full of some other form of matter, which we say is dark. Um, and in fact, it's not simply galaxies. If uh, in another talk, and in fact, in another whole session, not titled particle physics, we could go on about the evidence from bigger scales than galaxies and cosmology and the microwave background. The fact is that dark matter is, permeates our understanding of the universe uh, back to the earliest days of the Big Bang. Um, and so, for instance, this is a view of the Milky Way. The Milky Way uh, would be a galaxy, and it's, um, it's, a, it's embedded in this sort of larger, uh, sort of diffuse um, component of, of, of mass, which is overall about 10 times as much mass, maybe seven times as much mass as in the stars and the dust out of normal things. Um, part of that story, which I didn't tell, it really is very obvious from cosmology that the dark matter is not made of any normal elements. It is not made of neutrons and protons or anything built up out of neutrons and protons. So then it's natural to look to particle physics. And indeed, this is the particle physicist view of the world. This is like the particle physicist equivalent of the um, periodic table. And there's these fundamental particles. Uh, they all have different masses. And there's a few known forces. Uh, in this set of particles, only, a hand, only these ones here are stable. We know we can create all these. They live a short time. None of these work out to be the dark matter. But let's think about that a little bit. Um, how could we have the dominant form of mass in the Milky Way not be normal matter, and we've never detected it? And that's 
gets to what we mean by the size of a particle. Here, for instance, is an electron, and it's got an electric force field, but then at a very small scale, it's got a weak force field. And the ratio of these, uh, these, these forces um, is, is uh, uh, 100,000 and 100,000 fold that this, this force is shorter range than the electric force. A neutron, for instance, has a strong force, which is about 100,000 the size of the electric force, and also a weak force. And then there's the neutrino, which we know about. It only has this tiny little weak force field, which gives it an incredibly small size. So if a neutrino comes at ordinary matter, it passes right through, unless it just happens to strike, in some sense, the center. So in this picture, what would make sense is the dark matter. For something to be all through the galaxy and not have been seen so far, it's natural to make it something that has effectively a very small size, or perhaps, indeed, a force field that's the weak, that's like, that is either like or is the weak force we know about in particle physics. Then there's the freeze-out argument, which I decided I didn't have time to explain, and so very helpfully Lawrence has explained it to you. Let me phrase it my way. Any stable exotic new form of matter in the plasma of the hot bag bang, and what do I mean by that? I mean, if there's a type of, if there's a particle physics at a higher scale that we don't yet know, which would have created matter that was interacting in the early universe, if that particle happened to be about the weak scale of particle physics in terms of its size, then it would be dark matter today. And this is the compelling argument. Um, uh, some years ago, people called it the freeze-out argument. Some people now call it the Wimp miracle. I think it's better to call it the freeze-out argument. Um, that makes people look for a certain type of particle. You give it a weak force like a neutrino, but a mass, say, about like a gold atom. So it's a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. And this is still a very compelling idea, and we ought to go test it. How would you test it? Well, here again is a galaxy sort of shown in cutaway with a, uh, perversely in white, the dark matter in a halo. And all the matter in this, in this, in this halo is orbiting just like uh, the, uh, the rotation of the Milky Way. And so we know the speed of these particles. If here's a detector that's, say, about a meter in dimension, um, 100 billion of these particles will, just, will go through it uh, given, uh, given the velocity and density of these particles that we know from, from astrophysics. Or that's about 10 to the 16th a year. An interesting thing, interesting thing about a neutrino, a neutrino is so small, how small is it? A neutrino is so small that if you wanted to stop it, uh, you would essentially need a light year of lead. You go to the dentist and you get a small, you get a, light, a, lead, a lead shield for an x-ray and that's maybe a 32nd of an inch thick. If you want to stop a neutrino, you need a light year. A light year is about 10 to the 16th meters. So if you combine the idea that there's 10 to the 16th per year uh, through a meter-like thing, and they have a probability sort of an inverse of 10 to the 16th meters, then in a meter dimension detector, you might get about one per year. And that's the, uh, that's the, that's, that's the experimental goal. We want to build a detector. I'll explain the detector in a moment. And we're going to see about once a year one of these particles hitting it. The problem with that is that radioactivity is about 100 billion times higher than that. So it is like looking for the proverbial uh, needle in a haystack. We have to remove ambient radioactivity from just uh, um, uranium and thorium and potassium around us to an extreme level in order to look for these interactions. One piece of, 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 of radioactivity, of what you would think of as in generally as radioactivity is high energy particles from outer space, cosmic rays. These are high energy protons in particular and other particles raining down on the atmosphere, creating a cascade and a shower of particles on the surface of the Earth. One particular piece of that is a muon. And to get away from muons, you have to go deep underground. Um, there's a set of labs around the world. One in particular is um, in South Dakota in a gold mine. Um, uh, and uh, that is a tank of uh, water in which there is a detector. And being a mile underground, there's very few of these cosmic rays um, uh, striking it. So now inside of that water tank, we have a detector. Um, I would like to point, there we go. Uh, um, this is like the uh, cartoon I just showed you. And a uh, dark matter particle could strike it, say it's coming from below. 
Um, but the problem, of course, I mentioned is the, is the radioactivity. This particular detector is from the uh, Lux experiment. And the problem with the radioactivity is that outside in the rock, uh, you had all these gamma rays and neutrons, and they were trying to penetrate. Um, this enclosure we're in is a water tank. We fill it with water, and that water will sort of uh, stop all these particles. Water is not a particularly great um, material for that, but it's cheap, and you can put a lot of it. Even people are radioactive at this scale, so this fellow um, has to get out of the water tank before we fill it, or he'll, um, he'll be radioactive for the experiment. Um, let's look a little bit at how the detector works. There's actually um, a, a large number of uh, um, groups worldwide with different detector ideas uh, as to how to do this. Um, but I'm going to talk uh, about one particular one just to illustrate how this works. Um, so this is a, a so-called time projection chamber um, where the particle comes in, strikes material in the middle here. And the material in this case is liquefied xenon or liquefied argon um, and leaves. And there's a flash of light from the site where the, um, an atom or a nucleus of an atom was struck hard by the WIMP. Um, you measure the light with uh, light sensors, photomultiplier tubes, and also electrons are drifted upwards. There's um, uh, meshes here that create a strong electric field. And you pull the electrons to the surface of the liquid, and you actually pull them out of the liquid and in the gas. Uh, they make a small discharge, like at the center of a neon lamp. And you get a localization there. Um, and so you, you you basically can see where the event was in, in this direction from where that light is, and the time difference between that flash and that flash based on the electron drift speed gives you the, the depth. And so you find out that there was an interaction in, you, in this detector, and you know exactly where it was. That's the so-called time projection part of this. Um, here's what the data actually looks like from this, the Lux experiment. Um, the first flash of light can be as small as two measured photons. This is a photon, and that's a photon. Uh, this is time. And then a little while later, the electrons get to the surface, and you get a much uh, bigger flash, and that's measuring the electrons. Now, if we want to have a detector, and there's 100 billion times too much radioactivity, and then we think we've seen dark matter, how are we ever going to prove that we've seen it? And, and the way we will. Um, in this standard WIMP paradigm of dark matter, is that the dark matter is fundamentally a little bit different than almost all backgrounds. Dark matter strikes a nucleus, whereas most backgrounds are from things that strike an electron. A gamma ray strikes an electron in an atom. And so here's a low energy electron uh, getting struck by a, a gamma ray, and the in blue is where the electron wandered around and made charge and light that gave you signal. This is a scale that we cannot possibly resolve in a meter scale detector. That's about the width of a human hair, tenth of a micron. Small, that'd be a small human hair. Um, but if I think of a little box there and I expand it out, now we're looking at something that's about the size of 100 atoms. That is the recoil track if, you if, if, if a particle, um, which a wimp will, uh, strikes a nucleus. And you get a very small track. These are about the same energy, very, very different size track, both on a microscopic scale. The density of this track compared to that track um, leads to uh, a different signature in the amount of charge and light in this class of detector. So here um, on the vertical scale uh, is a measure of uh, how much charge to how much light. And on the horizontal scale is a measure essentially of energy, the light signal alone. And we expose the detector to what an intense amount of what will naturally be the radioactive backgrounds. And each dot is an event where the detector was struck. And we populate a region here kind of between these blue bands with a little spillover. And if we turn around and expose the detector to a neutron source, we populate a region between these red bands. Neutrons also look like WIMPs on an event per event basis, but neutrons are quite a bit easier to get rid of and to recognize otherwise in your detector. Um, and here's the world's leading data set looking for WIMP dark matter. Um, some population of events between the blue bands I showed you. And in this red region, a little spillover from the blue region, but nothing centered on the red region. So unfortunately, to cut to the chase, we haven't seen the dark matter yet. But this is a very promising way to look for it. Um, this was essentially 100 kilograms of material in a fraction of a year, and we've seen nothing. 
There is a very competitive set of experiments uh, looking for this type of dark matter. Um, one particular one, uh, which um, myself and a number of people actually in the room are part of, is was the Lux experiment and now um, a next generation Lux Zeppelin. So just to give a sense of where things are headed, this detector is instead of made of 300 kilograms of xenon, it's made with 10 tons of liqu liquefied xenon. Um, this is now a meter and a half scale. The previous one was only a half meter in scale. It'll be the largest dark matter experiment and 300 times more sensitive than Lux. This is the way we present our results. This is sort of a, a map of our, of our knowledge or ignorance of dark matter. We don't know the exact cross-section of dark matter, essentially the size of it. Um, we have guidance from the freeze-out argument. The freeze-out argument um, picked something sort of very vaguely, well, on this plot. Um, perhaps not so much at the bottom of the plot and not so much at the very top of the plot, uh, but vaguely on this plot. For various reasons, if you think it's a weakly interacting particle, you would expect it to be uh, related to the mass scale, which gives us the weak interaction, and that's more or less on the horizontal axis of this plot. If you sort of throw that out, then we can start going uh, down low or, or very, very high. Um, when you make a measurement, let's pick this one here. This was the measurement um, about a decade after this whole idea came up, and um, the very first of the sort of the modern detectors uh, they made a line like this, and what that meant is anything above this was ruled out. So a bigger cross-section would have meant more interactions, and that's excluded. And, it, and this line just goes straight on off. If, there are, if the dark matter particles are heavier, there's fewer of them, and that's why this line curves up. Uh, 100 GeV here is sort of like a heavy atom. Um, this is the current Lux experiment, so this is the world's exclusion now. We know it's not here. These are various models from supersymmetry that are still allowed after the LHC runs. And this is where LZ is going. And I'm on my last slide. Um, this is interesting. In, in, since the, the field started when actually limits were about here at this minus five level, we've advanced um, a good four orders of magnitude, which is really impressive. When the idea first came out, I think of uh, Lawrence's cycles, we had detectors that had a fraction of a kilogram and no background, and we set limits. Now we're building detectors that are on the 100 kilogram scale, and we haven't seen anything. We now basically see how to plow right on down. Give us money, and we're going to go. Um, for better or worse, something has now come up. Uh, in the last several years, people thought hard about where this was headed and realized that there are are neutrinos from cosmic rays, which are producing um, signals which look very much like the WIMP dark matter. Um, unless we can build a detector which can actually measure the direction of those individual tracks, this will be a floor which we cannot go below. This will be uh, a practical with, with, within money bounds limit to what we can do, and we're getting close to it. Um, so one thing we should definitely do is measure as much of this region as we can uh, down to this neutrino floor. There is no upper end of the data here. Um, down at lower masses, that's yet a whole other idea. Uh, and, and the different type of technology uh, can push in that direction. Um, although that's, uh, that's, that, that's sort of the next, the next world. So what is my summary? My summary is that we know there is dark matter and we don't know what it is. Weakly interacting fundamental particles are a good guess. They are a guess. But they're a good guess from both cosmology and particle physics. They certainly have been a good enough guess to launch a whole industry of people trying to do this. And after much effort, I'd say 20 years of effort, we do know how to test this idea to the limit it can be done uh, based on this neutrino background. And we should do that. And if we're lucky, the dark matter will be there. <laughs>